Great Britain declared war on Germany on the 4th of August 1914. Earlier, former West Australian Premier Sir John Forrest had declared if England was going to her Armageddon, Australia would go too. Another prominent politician, Sir Edward Whitnoom, stated in the West Australian Legislative Council that, despite the fact that he was a native-born Australian, he still regarded the country as a suburb of the Great British Empire. And so many thousands from all over Australia, believing in the cause of empire, joined the Army, Navy or Flying Corps units to fight an enemy on the other side of the world. In all, over 32,000 personnel from Western Australia were to join the armed forces during the course of the war. With the advent of new military technologies, such as sophisticated machine guns and artillery, the war quickly became a stalemate. Old-style infantry and cavalry charges had become redundant. Soon the war bogged down into static trench warfare along an extended front from the Swiss border through northern France and into southern Belgium. It became known as the Western Front. Australian troops, destined for this deadly killing ground, were held over, furthering their training in Egypt for many months. Winston Churchill, the British First Lord of the Admiralty, conceived a plan to break the Western Front stalemate. He proposed that a force should sail up the Dardanelles Seaway in Turkey, capture Istanbul, link up with their Russian allies, and mount a second front, moving against German forces from the east. However, the initial incursion into the Dardanelles by a joint British and French naval force on the 18th of March 1915 failed. In consequence, an army invasion of the Gallipoli Peninsula was mounted. On the 25th of April, therefore, the combined British and French force was landed at Cape Helles with the intent of moving upward through the Gallipoli Peninsula to link up with the Australian and New Zealand force which was to land at a location known as Garpa Tepe, to then storm upward and inland to reach the heights of the Sari Bear Range. With the capture of the whole area, it was thought that a combined drive to Istanbul would then be feasible. This, a painting by George Lambert, the original of which is now in the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, portrays the Western Australian 11th Infantry Battalion driving upward through a thick, scrub-covered steep incline adjacent to what was to become known as Anzac Cove. The 11th Battalion was later joined by other West Australian Infantry Battalions, the 16th, the 28th and then the 10th Light Horse Regiment, the members serving as foot soldiers on Gallipoli. Other personnel, of course, were involved with artillery units. The Turkish forces recovered quickly, however, and reacted effectively to the Allied incursions and forced the Australians and New Zealanders back to defensive positions, as indicated on this map. The Turks were invariably on higher ground, looking down on the Anzac positions, and no position was safe. The troops dug in and fought tenaciously to hold on. But their other enemy was disease. They shared their trenches with rats, cockroaches and fleas and flies in the heat and the dust. Sickness among the troops became almost as significant a threat as an enemy bullet or shell. They clung on for around eight months, however, losing over 8,000 men. The attrition rates were substantial and reinforcements were constantly required. This graphic is a group of young Western Australians who had completed their three months training at Black Boy Hill in the foothills of the Darling Range, east of Perth, and who were about to embark with the 4th reinforcements to the 16th Infantry Battalion. <laughs> 
Note, especially, the smallest lad on the left, temporary Sergeant Arnold Potts, formerly of Kalgoorlie, who was to become one of the West Australia's most notable soldiers in two world wars. Such were the conditions on the Gallipoli battlefield that the bodies of many men could not be recovered or positively identified until after the war. However, all are commemorated today on the main memorial at Lone Pine in the centre of the Anzac area of engagement in 1915. This view, looking down towards the Ari Banu Spit, immediately north of Anzac Cove, is from Walker's Ridge, above. It gives an idea of the terrain inland from the Enzac landings. This is the shoulder patch of the Western Australian 10th Light Horse Regiment, a unit which is still operational today with the same distinctive badge. The 10th Light Horse were most notably involved in a fatal charge at a position called the Neck in the early morning of the 7th of August during the so-called Second Offensive on Gallipoli, an attempt by the Anzac forces to capture the heights at Shonok Bear. The West Australian Light Horsemen knew their fate before they went over the top to charge the Turkish trenches. Two waves of Victorian Light Horsemen had preceded them with disastrous results. Many bodies lay across the top of the trenches and out in front of them as they waited for the signal to go. The action at the neck was dramatically recreated in Peter Weir's poignant film Gallipoli. Many young men, sometimes described as the flower of West Australian youth, died in the deadly futile charge against the Turkish machine guns. Theirs was a great sacrifice. Knowing what was in store for them, the question could therefore be asked, what prompts men, knowing their likely fate, to go forward on command to an almost certain finality. This is the memorial at the Neck on Gallipoli today. But after the war only a very small number of bodies could be positively identified and therefore there are only a handful of commemoration plaques located at the actual site today. In consequence the names of the majority of the young men who were killed at the Neck are located on the main memorial at Lone Pine. The Anzac forces were evacuated from Gallipoli in mid-December 1915. They were shipped back to Egypt and there were reorganised and refitted. From there they were shipped to the French port of Marseille, after which they travelled by train to the Western Front in northern France. Their first involvement was in the region of Armentiers, which, on the map, you will see is a little to the southeast of Calais on the French coast. Captain Cecil Foss, a farmer from Mabigan in the wheat belt of Western Australia, and a veteran of the 28th Battalion's time on Gilberley, won a military cross for gallantry when he led the first assault at Amintes on German entrenchments by Australians during the Great War. Tragedy followed, however. He was killed at Pozier later that year. His remaining two brothers, who also served, were also killed during the course of the war. The Foss brothers' medals are now in the medal collection of the Army Museum of Western Australia. Early in 1916, the British government requested of Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes more troops for the Western Front. There was a problem, however. In a volunteer army, insufficient numbers were joining up to replenish the casualties from the Gallipoli failure. Accordingly, the Australian government commissioned a theatrical entrepreneur, J.C. Williamson, to stage the first Anzac Day parades in all of the capital cities of Australia and in London on the 25th of April 1916. Brass bands, splendid speeches, bright banners and splendidly arrayed marching troops ensured that recruiting figures rose appreciably enough to more than fill the ranks for the killing fields of Europe. 
the public relations exercise was a triumph that was to have tragic consequences for many within Australia. With a population of only a little over five million at the time, hardly any family was to remain untouched by the war. Typical of those enthused by the patriotic splendour and excitement of the first Anzac Day parade through the streets of Perth were these three friends from Collie, where they worked on the coal mines. Frank Aylett, a descendant of a Tasmanian convict, was originally from Bunbury and was a blacksmith farrier attending the horses at the mines. Ben Sampson was a migrant from Wales and was engaged to be married to Frank's sister, Pixie. Jim was also from Bunbury and was engaged to another of Frank's sisters, Addie. Frank was going steady with Mavis Suchbury at the time and was thought another engagement was in the wind. But, forsaking a certain future, the mates all joined up together in 1916 following the first Anzac Day parade, in which Frank's brother was a participant with the newly formed 44th Battalion. Months later, they sailed off for the Western Front after preliminary training. Following engagements in the British Northern Sector of the Western Front earlier in 1916, Australian troops were sent south to Fromel and then to the Somme region to participate in the great Allied push against German positions to begin on the 1st of July 1916. Locate the city of Amiens on this more detailed map, central, extreme left, and you will see the Somme River flowing through it. At two o'clock from Amiens, in the top right quadrant of the map, you'll be able to note the towns of Albert and Pozieres. It was at these locations that the Australian troops became involved after the disastrous opening thrust by the British forces on the 1st of July 1916, when over 50,000 men became casualties on the first day. The Australian force was then inserted, organising and staging through Albert, towards the village of Pozier. This picture is of Albert Town Hall, devastated by German artillery fire. Today, an outstanding extensive museum is located in a tunnel system, first excavated during those perilous times, beneath the splendidly rebuilt town hall. The aim was to capture the village of Pozier and then the windmill site just beyond. The windmill sat on the highest promontory in the region and from there gave a commanding view of the surrounding landscape. Command of the high ground in the days before aircraft surveillance had been adopted was vital to a command of the battlefield. Note in the bottom left hand corner of the map the name Sausage Valley, which is at about 8 o'clock from the name Chalk Pit. It was named thus because the troops soon saw themselves as being meat fend into a war machine grinder. It has been estimated that a very high percentage of those killed in the region were obliterated by the intense German artillery bombardments as they filed into the trench lines. This is Pozier, a tranquil small agricultural village before the war. This is Pozier's village after the eventual success of the bloody and protracted push through to the windmill site just beyond the town. Pictured is the first Australian Division Memorial on the outskirts of Pozier today. It commemorates that division's 7,700 men lost in a matter of weeks. The second division then lost 8,100 men and the 4th Australian Division lost 7,100 when they were inserted into the battle. Casualties on Gallipoli were light by comparison. Charles Bean, the Australian Great War historian, wrote of the battle for the Pozier's Ridge, 
it is more densely sown with Australian sacrifice than any place on earth. On the horizon in the photograph is the ridge line so furiously defended by the German forces. The first Victoria Cross, the highest decoration for bravery above and beyond the call of duty, awarded to a West Australian on the Western Front, went to Private Martin Namara of the 16th Battalion for his gallantry at Poziers and Mogo Farm. His Victoria Cross is held by the Army Museum of Western Australia at its Fremantle premises. On that fateful ridge line today stands the British Tifal Memorial to the Missing. Over 80,000 names are placed there, commemorating the soldiers who were never found after the battle. Following the winter lull in the fighting, the Australian troops were moved a little northward to take part in a campaign to break through the so-called Hindenburg Line, a vast tangled line of brutal coils of barbed wire, in March 1917. The newfangled tank, first used inexpertly in 1916, was to be used, this time hopefully more effectively. Again the campaign was a disaster. The artillery failed to cut the wire and many tanks broke down or became lost, inflicting heavy casualties on their own troops in the process. The Western Australian 16th Infantry Battalion went into the engagement with a near full complement of over 900 men. On the first night they incurred approximately 700 casualties many of them from the disoriented British tanks. It is worth noting that the 16th Battalion, which, when fully manned, mustered a thousand men in its ranks, during the course of the Great War had around six to seven thousand personnel pass through the ranks of the unit between 1914 and 1918. A sobering statistic. This memorial is located in the main street of Bogcourt village. Note the distinctive slouch hat, a poignant reminder of Australian involvement in that disastrous action. It was here that Private Frank Aylett of the 27th Infantry Battalion, one of those who had enthusiastically joined up after the first Anzac Day parade through the streets of Perth, participating in his first action, was killed during a German artillery bombardment. Earlier in the day, but too late to be activated, his transfer to an artillery unit had just come through. This temporary grave of Frank Aylett, close to the site where he was killed, was typical of the initial nature of the burial of many of the troops at least those who could be positively identified. Later, the bulk of the Australian troops were moved northward again, along the Western Front and into southern Belgium, in the general area known as the Ypres Salient, a bulge in the Allied lines which was fought over furiously throughout the war. Locate Ypres on the map. It was in this region that much of the furious fighting took place in 1917. Firstly, Menin Road, where Adolf Hitler was stationed, in the middle of the year, to the punishing battles for the Passchendaele Ridge outside Ypres in October. This graphic shows the Menin Gate on the outskirts of the town of Ypres, pronounced by many Allied troops as wipers. It is estimated that over a million men marched through this gate during the course of the war to the battlefields beyond, including Hill 60 and Polygon Wood, besides Passchendaele, and lost their lives. Each night, 365 days per year to this day, Members of the local brass band play The Last Post, 
at 8 o'clock each evening. Hail, rain, snow, sleet or sunshine. It is a short but very moving ceremony. Engraved on the faces and portals of the gateway are the names of over 50,000 soldiers from all over the British Empire who have never been found. The Australian involvement in the battle for the Passchendaele Ridge took place through October 1917, moving upward through thick mud and driving rain. Conditions were appalling and casualties horrendous. The Tynecott Cemetery on the slopes leading up to the Passchendaele Ridge commemorates 25,000 soldiers of the British Empire who died on this battlefield and were positively identified. The commemoration cross seen here was built on one of the German machine gun bunkers which devastated the attacking troops as they climbed upward through heavy mud and driving rain to capture the ridge beyond. Lance Corporal Ben Sampson of the 32nd Battalion engaged to Frank Aylett's sister Pixie was killed during the Battle of Pollock and Wood close by. Private Jim Robb of the 48th Battalion, engaged to Frank's sister Addie, was badly wounded during the Passchendaele action and died several days later. Another of those wounded during the Passchendaele action was Sergeant Ross McClarty, a farmer from Penjarra and of the Western Australian 44th Battalion. But he was to survive and for his bravery in the action was decorated with the Military Medal. Subsequently, during the Second World War, Ross commanded the local 44th Battalion in its role as a Home Guard unit. After World War II, he became the Liberal Premier of Western Australia and was knighted by the Queen for his services to the state. After the Russian Revolution of late 1917, Russia withdrew from the war, allowing German troops on the Eastern Front to be transferred to the Western Front. As the spring of 1918 approached, German High Command, with many more troops and equipment now at their disposal, prepared to mount the so-called Michael Offensive in an effort to break through the Allied lines, reach Paris and end the war. Australian troops were rushed south to bolster defences, again in the Somme Valley region. German forces did break through the previously hard-won sites such as Poziers to threaten the city of Amiens. The Australian forces, fighting furiously, managed to hold the German advance in the region of the village of Vieux Bretonneur in April 1918. Note in this graphic, taken at the Via Bretonneur Memorial, Amiens is on the horizon, indicating how close the German offensive came to breaking through. Today, the largest Australian Great War Cemetery stands outside the village of Via Bretonneur, in the location where many Australians fought and died during those desperate spring months of 1918. One of those commemorated at the Via Britannia site is Lieutenant Francis Burt. It is interesting to note that the very first commemorative plaque in the Honour Avenue at Kings Park is for this young man. To the left of this picture, the Somme River flows, and on the rise over the river is a memorial at the crash site of German fighter pilot ace Manfred von Richthofen, the Bloody Red Baron. Also killed in that vicinity was Gunner Ernie Parker, a member of an artillery unit. As you can see, Ernie was one of Western Australia's most famous sportsmen. Today he is commemorated in the Western Australian Sportsman's Hall of Fame at Challenge Stadium in Floriot. Following the successful blocking of the German Michael Offensive, Allied troops mounted a concerted push back against German forces. 
A major offensive took place at La Hamel early in July 1918. For the first time, infantry, artillery, tanks and aircraft were successfully coordinated in a sustained attack against enemy lines. It was the beginning of the end for the German forces as they were repeatedly pushed back by the combined power of American, British, Australian, French and Canadian forces. Badly wounded in that action was Captain Arnold Potts, the small 19-year-old on the extreme left in this early 1915 picture, who had won a military cross for bravery as the commanding officer of the 4th Light Trench Mortar Battery while at Moquet Farm near Poziers in late 1916. He was repatriated to Wandsworth Hospital in London to survive after being seriously ill for some time, but unable to be repatriated back to Australia until early in 1919. Also wounded in that action was Corporal Ted Aylett, serving with the 44th Battalion. He was the elder brother of Frank, who had been killed at Buller Court 15 months before. Ted survived, though not unscathed, to return to Australia. The Allied troops continued their advance against the weakening German forces, and the last involvement by Australian troops was at Mont Brahan on the 4th of 5th of October 1918. This graphic shows the memorial to the fallen troops in that region. The Australian forces were then withdrawn and waited in the rear lines for the end of the war, which officially came into effect at 11 o'clock on the 11th of November 1918. You will recall that Private Frank Aylett younger brother of Ted, was killed at Buller Court in the late March of 1917 and was buried in a temporary grave with a crude cross marking his position. It was not to be for some years after the war that more permanent headstones were erected in dedicated cemeteries along the Western Front for those who had lost their lives. This picture shows descendants of Frank's family inspecting his headstone, which is the third from the left in the back row, the first to do so from the family 75 years after he was killed. The inscription on the headstone reads, A faithful son always remembered. It was one chosen by his grieving parents, though never able to see themselves in those days of expensive and difficult travel it would have been the same circumstance for thousands of similarly bereaved families during that sad era. If you wish to find the site of a particular grave in any of these conflict areas, from Gallipoli to the Western Front and to the Middle Eastern areas, and directions on how to travel to them, you should contact the very thorough services provided by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. However, we should not forget that the Western Australian 10th Light Horse Regiment, which had fought on Gallipoli as infantry, had not been sent to France with the infantry and artillery units early in 1916. They stayed in Egypt, now reunited with their horses, initially becoming involved in the defence of the Suez Canal region from large Turkish forces entrenched within the Sinai Desert in Palestine and further north in Syria. Their first major involvement was at the Battle of Romani in early August 1916, when Turkish troops came perilously close to the Suez Canal. Thereafter, the Australian Light Horse units were heavily involved in gradually forcing the Turkish forces back towards their heavily defended Gaza line of defences. The film The Light Horseman tells the tale of the last great cavalry charge in history by elements of the Australian Light Horse against the Turkish-held village of Beersheba in October 1917. Thereafter came The Breakout in 
are pushed through Jerusalem and up the Jordan Valley toward Damascus, which was finally captured on the 1st of October 1918. Lieutenant Charlie Folks Taylor, a pastoralist from the northwest, had won a military cross for his part in a raid against a Turkish stronghold across the Jordan River earlier in 1918. Later, as officer in charge of the 10th Light Horse Scouts, he was first into Damascus in that early morning of the 1st of October, and took a quick surrender from some officials before riding on hurriedly pursuing Turkish troops through the city. He was annoyed subsequently that Lawrence of Arabia received all the plaudits, entering the city later in the morning to great fanfare, riding in a Rolls-Royce car. Much of the action, the politics and Lawrence's triumphal entry into Damascus is portrayed in the David Lean film, Lawrence of Arabia. Another Western Australian involved in the Light Horse campaigns was George Maitland, stroke of the winning head of the River Crew in 1914 and his school's mild champion. After leaving school, George went to Melbourne University to study engineering. He hated it, so left and joined the Victorian 4th Light Horse Regiment. His first job after arriving in the Middle East was making coffins for the unfortunate members of his unit. George became a stretcher bearer and won a Distinguished Conduct Medal for rescuing another soldier under fire, placing him on a horse and eventually getting him to a first aid post for treatment. Remarkably, during the Second World War in 1941, now a qualified doctor, George similarly rescued a soldier under fire, this time with a truck and in much the same area. He was again awarded a medal for gallantry and for his efficiency in commanding the 2nd 6th Field Ambulance, the Distinguished Service Order. Later he served in New Guinea and ended the Second World War as Deputy Director of the Australian Army Medical Services with the rank of Brigadier. Another Western Australian light horseman was Trooper Raymond Cowan, the son of the resident magistrate in Northam. Raymond was a reinforcement, but served with the 10th Regiment through the drive towards Damascus in 1918. He was unfortunate to contract malaria somewhere along the campaign route and died in Damascus after the surrender was taken and the war had ended in that region. By agreement, the last shots of the war were fired around 11 o'clock on the 11th of November 1918. The terms of the peace treaty between all of the nations, the Treaty of Versailles, were signed only after lengthy negotiations at the Palace of Versailles outside Paris on the 28th of June 1919. You may wish to note this outline of the major Australian engagements during the course of the Great War 1914-18. These three medals are the standard issue for those who served during the course of the Great War. The 1914-15 star on the left was awarded only to those who had served on Gallipoli and for operations against German locations in New Guinea in 1914 and for the defence of the Suez Canal in 1915. However, in 1967 the government awarded a specially struck medal to those surviving veterans who had served on Gallipoli. On behalf of those who were deceased before that date, the family may still claim the medal of their Gallipoli veteran upon verification. It had been a long war for some and many arrived back safely but disillusioned by what they had experienced and endured. Staff Sergeant Ralph Edgar, a decorated member of an artillery unit for over four years from Gallipoli through to the final phases of the Western Front fighting, sent back word to his brother who was to meet him 
when his ship berthed in Albany, to have a suit of civilian clothes ready for him. On the train from Albany to Narragin, Ralph changed into his new civilian clothes and threw all of his army uniform out of the carriage window. For many years following then, he worked as a farrier in the desolate but pristine landscape of Western Australia's pastoral country in the northwestern regions of the state, as far from the cloying mud and tragedy of the Western Front as he could possibly be. Another to safely return was Roy Phillips, formerly a bookkeeper on a northwest station before he joined the 28th Infantry Battalion after the outbreak of the war. He subsequently served on Gallipoli and was badly wounded. He was to be sent back to Australia, but instead he managed to have himself transferred across to an Air Force squadron in England as part of the administrative staff. While there he wangled himself some flying lessons, and remarkably soon qualified and gained his wings as a pilot. Eventually, after joining No. 2 Squadron of the Australian Flying Corps, Roy became its second highest top scoring ace, with 15 confirmed kills and a string of probables. Here he is in 1918, a wily veteran of the squadron third from the right, in the front row. Roy Phillips ended the war with two military crosses and a distinguished flying cross, along with the usual service medals. During the Second World War, he was appointed the squadron leader officer in charge of the flying school at Archfield in Brisbane. He was killed in a flying accident in 1942. You may recall the badly wounded Captain Arnold Potts, one of the youngest company commanders in the Australian Imperial Force, when he won his military cross for gallantry at Mokay Farm, and then, close to two years later, had been badly wounded at Le Hamel in July 1918. He returned to Australia and eventually took up farming outside Kojanup, where he became actively involved in local community affairs. However, when World War II broke out, Potts joined up again to serve with his original battalion, the 16th, in Palestine and Syria in 1941. Then, after returning to Australia with them early in 1942, he was appointed to command the 21st Brigade on the Kokoda Track in the fighting withdrawal against the advancing Japanese, intent on capturing the airfields at Port Moresby thereby directly threatening the mainland of Australia. Potts's leadership in organising the defence against the Japanese advance was crucial in that perilous period of the war. The full story of his outstanding civilian and military careers is told in this biography of his eventful life, a truly outstanding Western Australian. The War Memorial in Kings Park was opened in 1929 and commemorates those Western Australians who paid the supreme sacrifice during the course of the Great War. Overall 313,000 enlisted voluntarily throughout Australia for service overseas during the course of the war. 61,720 lost their lives and 155,000 were wounded. In other words, the chance of being killed or wounded was about 50%. It was a considerable sacrifice for a country with a population of only a little over 5 million at the time. The total enlistments of Western Australians was 32,231, which at 9.9% .9 against the population of the state was the highest percentage of all the Australian states. Over 1,600 commemorative plaques dedicated to Western Australians who lost their lives during the various conflicts in which Australia has been engaged have now been placed in the Honour Avenues in Kings Park. <laughs>
By the end of the conflict, the participating Allied nations had suffered around 3 million casualties, but in many locations the front line had barely shifted 100 metres. Should we pause and contemplate, therefore, amid the modern celebrations, remembrances and nostalgia, and reflect a little more thoughtfully on the tragic lessons provided by that unfortunate lost generation. <laughs>